Okay guys, you all should have the all the tools and knowledge that you need to be able to write pretty good intro and method sections uh, for an APA style main script. You, that was something you did for um, project number one. You have not yet written a results section or a discussion section, at least not in this class, and so what I wanted to do over the next uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so is to share with you some, I guess, best practices and advice and tips related to the writing of uh, results and discussion sections. Now, as far as the results section goes, you might start by um, informing the reader of what statistical operations you use to analyze your data. And so what I mean by that is, um, so what kind of model did you actually use? For many of you, uh, in, in fact, maybe even all of you, that's going to be some flavor uh, or some variant of an analysis of variance. And so here's an example. So you know we conducted a 3 by 2 uh, ANOVA, where we had one between subjects factor, which was a group variable. We had one within subjects factor, which was a time variable. So in other words, if people you measure people twice. Uh, for instance, in a pre-post sort of way, that would be included as a um, as a within subjects uh, variable. So you're going to have to modify this according to what you actually did. But the first thing you'll do is just to uh, tell the reader what you actually um, the model that you're using to analyze your data. You should recall that uh, I had you do this in project one to report this information at the end of the method section, and you can do it there. So the bottom line really is that it has to be somewhere. If if you, you you're welcome to include it at the end of the method section in a section called data analytic plan or something like that, or you're welcome to do it at the start of, uh, of the results section. Uh, whatever you feel is most intuitive or most logical, um, you're welcome to do, but it should appear somewhere. Now, one of the primary things you're going to eventually be doing with your results section is just you're going to be reporting the results of lots and lots of statistical tests. You know, so there's going to be F values and P values that are going to be strewn about um, everywhere. But I would say, though, that before you even do that, though, I would remind the reader of what your hypothesis uh, actually is. The reader, if he or she is attentive, should s remember really from the end of your introduction what you're hypothesizing really, but it probably bears repeating and it probably bears just reminding the reader uh, of what that was so they're absolutely clear about it before they proceed with the uh, with your reporting of the results. I would also say that it's a useful thing to do to answer your question um, in plain English. And so if you have a question in, related to the effect of some uh, kind of manipulation on uh, some outcome, you're eventually going to bring to bear lots of statistical evidence that would help the reader to figure out whether the hypothesis is supported uh, or not supported, or to, to use that statistical evidence to answer that question. But I would say right up front, though, before you even get to that statistical uh, evidence, you might just consider saying, you know, here's the answer in plain English. Uh, in fact, our hypothesis that, um, you know, predicted this effect on that outcome was, in fact, not supported. And then, and only then, would you get to the statistical test that would say, in, in, in essence, and here's why. Here's the statistical evidence that we have that would suggest that it either was supported um, or not supported. So then, of course, after you do that, you're going to um, hit us with the actual statistical tests. And then also, and this is highlighted in yellow, so I think this is kind of important, also interpret the statistical tests on the fly. I think that a lot of you maybe have a sense that the interpretation is really reserved for the discussion section, that that's what the discussion section is uh, is designed to do. And certainly it is, but I would also say, too, though, that you're going to be helping the reader a great deal to the extent that you do some sort of at least minimal interpretation of the uh, of your results right on the fly, right in the context of your uh, results section after you actually discuss the results of your statistical tests. So here's an example of what I mean. If we go back to that analysis of variance that you may have used to analyze your data, um, in the first line here you're talking about the, a main effective group and then you have the F value, you have the P value, the degrees of freedom and all that kind of stuff. And then in the next sentence though what you're doing is you're actually helping the reader to um, to interpret what that effect actually means. So it says here participants in the music condition show lower heart rates compared to participants in the control condition. So what you're doing is you're um, for one thing, you're specifying the direction of that effect, you know, which one had higher, which one had lower. You're, you're just giving some good context that will help the reader to figure out um, to figure out what that uh, what that group main effect uh, actually means. What I've also done here is I've included descriptive statistics in that interpretation as well, uh, as well. so the actual means and SDs for both of those groups. That's also a really useful thing to do um, as well. It's just, uh, it'll, it'll help your reader to just to visualize what's going on really in your data. Um, I think in a, in a much more effective way than just purely reporting results of the, uh, um, in this case, the F-test. Um, I'll remind you that it's customary to discuss main effects um, first and then interpret and then to discuss and interpret interactions. So if you guys, if you have a model in which you have multiple you know factors, and I think 
Um, most of you do, maybe even all of you do, so you're going to end up with uh, at least a couple of main effects and also uh, an interaction. You should go pre be prepared to discuss the main effects uh, first, report those and discuss those first, and then to interpret, uh, report and, uh, and interpret the interactions. Um, second, I'll note that if you do have a significant interaction, um, you may recall that the uh, interpretation of the interaction really sort of supersedes in a lot of ways the, the um, discussion of the main effects such that if a, a significant interaction is present it sort of makes risky interpretation of the main effects uh, in many ways and so then at that point if it is significant that that significant interaction really becomes um, uh, really becomes primary so we can talk about this more certainly in the context of your individual groups if you have um, uh, interaction effects that turn out to be significant we can talk about ways of um, of structuring your um, your reporting of the results in ways that I think uh, in ways that make sense and in ways that are consistent with uh, you know some of the best practices in, in, in terms of the field. At the end of the results section you should consider a sentence or two that summarizes um, the whole thing so you may one last time remind the reader of the uh, hypothesis one last time in a very broad general sort of way remind the reader of some of the evidence that you brought to bear that would either um, support that hypothesis that would uh, not support that hypothesis that would argue for sort of a kind of a mixed evidence you know whether uh, as to whether or not that hypothesis um, is supported uh, or not. You should also consider the possibility that figures or tables are likely to be very helpful to your readers in helping to summarize data. Um, I'm not going to require this, um, certainly. If you feel like you can report all the results of your statistical tests uh, just in a narrative sort of way in your text, then you're welcome to do it. But a lot of re readers will appreciate figures, especially if they're well constructed, and tables if they're well constructed, because they really can um, help the reader to visualize data in a, a, a much, much you know, easier sort of way. And you make uh, readers' lives easier if you actually do this. If you do choose to do it, I would just um, tell you that um, they shouldn't be embedded in text as per um, APA style or the you know kind of conventions for APA style manuscripts. Um, you guys probably know at this point that I'm um, pretty much the farthest thing from APA style police. You know, I'm not going to be terribly. I'm not going to throw a temper tantrum if you include the uh, if you include result. Uh, sorry, tables or figures in text, uh, but strictly speaking though, if you follow um, APA style by the book, then they should appear at the end of the manuscript. We can talk more about this if you'd like to, or you can consult models, um, certainly online. I think on the APA website, for instance, they have like model manuscripts, um, and you can see where the, um, and you can see that the tables and figures are included at the end of the manuscript and not actually embedded in text. Um, but, you know, but again, either way, if you want to do it either way, it's not going to be a, a, a really big deal. Let's see a few things about the discussion section. You're, you're, the number one thing you're trying to do here, really, is you're trying to just tell the reader, um, uh, here's what I've learned, here's what we've learned in the course of actually doing this study. So you'll say a, maybe a brief reiteration of the actual results uh, of the study, but you can keep this to a minimum, really, because if you... Um, you're gonna. You will have already reported the results in the results section. Of course, you will have already done some. You know, at least modest interpretation, some minimal interpretation in the results section. So the reader very likely um, has the the results down. They know what you've actually found. So they probably are going to be as, asking for and, and desiring um, different kinds of things, or at least additional things uh, beyond just the uh, a regurgitation of the actual results. For instance, here are some of the things that you might consider uh, including in the discussion section. Uh, the question of do the findings agree with previous research? Um, you guys all have upwards of maybe even a dozen, possibly even more studies that served as the basis of your uh, of your literature review, and so there was a very likely a wide range of results that were generated in those studies. And so what you may consider doing is looking at your study, your results, and then informing the reader, telling the reader uh, about the extent to which your results either agree with or don't agree with. Um, previous research, and especially in instances where there is some divergence. That they, in other words, you've generated results that really seem to be at odds with results that have been generated in lots of previous research. You might consider saying a few words about why you think that might be. Um, you may never know for certain why that is, and so it says here that that's often highly speculative, um, and that's quite true, but it's often a, a, a useful thing to do to give some context as to, or to give your perspective on why you think there is divergence between uh, your results and previous results. Uh, it's also the case that if you have um, data that you think are especially surprising in some way, counterintuitive, um, kind of curious, that don't make sense, 
then it's also you know nice to bring that up as well and to talk about your perspective on as to you know what you think is uh, what you think is going on there. So really, so a key task really of your discussion is to really integrate uh, your findings with the findings of previous uh, of previous research and to synthesize um, again synthesize your findings with what's already known uh, on the topic. Another key task, I think, is to would be to talk about the implications um, of the studies. So I'm talking about practical implications, clinical implications, maybe theoretical implications. Uh, as far as practical implications go, I would, uh, as one example, one of the groups in the class is pursuing a, a question related to the effect of different kinds of messages related to um, weight and diet and exercise and things like that on a um, on self-esteem and on mood and things like that and so um, one could easily I think envision a scenario in which that kind of information and the results of that study could be um, uh, useful in, in a highly practical sort of way so um, if maybe one question is um, how should advertisers approach their marketing materials to young women is it a good idea to include uh, you know models that are unusually small uh, things and if you do what are going to be the implications on on a you know the recipient of that um, the recipient of that um, uh, ad or the viewer of that ad what are going to be the implications for the person's psychological functioning you know that seems like it's a highly practical um, sort of question and you may have based upon your results you may have certain kinds of thoughts in relation to you know how advertising should be carried out how marketing should be carried out so um, other groups may have some uh, you know it, it may be more of a stretch to think about practical implications but I'll encourage you to at least try to think about some of the practical implications of your um, of your studies. Clinical implications, that's pretty similar in a lot of ways, really. You're just asking, you know, do you think that uh, your results have any bearing on clinical practice, on psychotherapy, for instance, for, for instance on, oh, yeah, gosh, assessment of psychiatric problems, you know, things like that. Again, for many of you, that may be a bit of a stretch, but I'd encourage you to think about it. Theoretical implications, if you think that your study has um, has some sort of special bearing on uh, existing theories uh, in the area, if you think that it's especially supportive of a given theory, uh, if you think that it's especially unsupportive of a given theory in relation in, in terms of some phenomenon, then I think it's a, a useful thing to do to um, to talk about that in the discussion as well. It's also important to talk about strengths and weaknesses. That's really kind of common fare, really, for any discussion section. What were the things that were uh, some of the strengths? Um, weaknesses, uh, I think that it's the case that in, in every research project, not just yours, but in every research project, there are a lot of ways in which the study is limited. Um, and I would encourage you to um, certainly uh, don't just go for the low-hanging fruit. You know, there's some of the usual suspects when it comes to weaknesses. It comes to weaknesses like we had a really small sample size. We had a restricted sample in that it was just college students. Uh, we had subjects who didn't seem to be taking the study all that seriously. Things like that. All that may be true, and all that may be um, really important to take account of. But I would also encourage you to to, to kind of move beyond just that low-hanging fruit and to come up with you know weaknesses that you think may be more uh, substantive, maybe or more meaningful, more important. And then also directions um, for future research as well. So the point is that there's this body of knowledge that's out there. Your study attempted to contribute to that body of knowledge um, in some way. But the point is that there's always more to be learned, really, about any topic. And so it, it, in, in a lot of cases, it could be useful for you to offer your perspective on what still needs to be learned, uh, what kind of knowledge still needs to be generated, and uh, where future research um, should be directed in light of uh, in light of what you've learned. You know, in some cases, this could follow directly from weaknesses because one direction or some directions for future research could be to just you know build upon or to address weaknesses that that um, exist uh, not only in your study but also weaknesses in, in maybe previous studies that inspired your study really as well. So they could build directly from weaknesses, um, but they could also be somewhat separate really as well. Just a couple of final notes. You guys have that BEM paper. Um, that I posted to Blackboard at the very start of the semester that talks about uh, writing of the empirical paper. There's a section that talks about uh, the results section and also the discussion section as well. I'm going to have you consult that uh, because I think that it's really, really strong uh, in a lot of ways. So I've already mentioned that it's really made me a much better writer of these things. Of, uh, of APA style manuscripts and I think it will you as well. So consult them and also use the articles that you've accumulated as um, as uh, guides, these are all in, in pretty much every case empirical articles that involve the reporting of uh, or, uh, results and 
the writing of discussion sections uh, and so on and so you should use them as kind of like a you know a recipe or a rough as a rough guide as to how you should approach um, your own so I think that that's a uh, that's an important idea uh, on the other hand each circumstance is um, unique and so um, you know I think a lot of the things that I've tried to impart to you over the last uh, looks like 14 minutes uh, now uh, I think should cut across lots of circumstances and should, should be relevant to all of you and on the other hand you're all pursuing ideas and things that are a little bit um, unique and so in, in those cases just you know please do feel free to use me as a resource and I'll try to be as helpful as I uh, as I can I have five seconds left and I'm almost done so thanks for viewing <laughs>